One of our viewers requested us to talk about CTOS in the comment box and that's what we'll do today. CTOS, one of the hottest IPO in 2021. Everyone is talking about it. There are so many videos on YouTube on this topic. But what makes this more interesting is its major shareholder, Mr. Brahma, who is known to be a super investor with a Midas touch. Just look at Mr. DIY, a company that he listed last year. The stock price doubled in a span of less than a year. Many people are expecting CTOS to follow the performance of Mr. DIY. And guess what? Recently, he purchased a 30% stake in Loop. Who is this mysterious man? What were the previous companies that he invested in? Does he really have the Midas touch? And CTOS can buy or not. Hi, I'm Frankie. Welcome back to my fuck show. Frankie answers questions. Today, we'll be talking about CTOS and the man behind the golden touch. Question 1. Who is Brahma? Many of you probably only heard of him recently because of Mr. DIY's IPO. But when I first heard of him in 2012, he was a new kid on the block. He bought a 10% stake in Old Town for 45 million ringgit and aggressively expanded the business all the way to China. By 2013, he did a partial exit and doubled his investments. This profitable investment immediately made him a legend in the investment industry. At that point, everyone has the same question in mind. Who is this low-profile gentleman? From what I know, Mr. Brahma is a graduate from Harvard Business School and Imperial College in London. He started his career working for BAT, DCG and Astro before he moved to India to become the managing director of Chris Capital, a private equity fund there. Later on, he came back to Malaysia and founded Cradle in 2011, focusing on high growth markets in South and Southeast Asia. Since then, he launched four funds under Cradle, raising a total of 1.5 billion US dollars. Today, this low-profile gentleman makes headlines in every investment that he makes. Sometimes, you will even hear people say, Got Brahma, can't go wrong, just follow. But is that true? Question 2. What are Brahma's notable past deals? Other than Old Town that I mentioned earlier, he has a stake in many household brands that you probably heard of, such as 7-Eleven, Big Pharmacy, Baked with Yen, Mr. DIY, CTOS, and the most recent one, Eli. Can you see the pattern here? <sighs> Question 3. Why is he able to deliver such results? If I know, my name would be Brahma Lim. I don't know the details, but I'm sure by now you would have observed a certain pattern in his investments. First, the type of company. Big Pharmacy, Old Town, Mr. DIY, Big Fifth Yen. What do they have in common? They are all retail and consumer businesses that sell to a diversified base of consumers. I call this a cookie cutter business. Just take the same mold and it can be replicated over and over again. This kind of business is simple and easy to scale. For example, Mr. DIY. Anyone everywhere in the world likes cheap things. Therefore, technically speaking, Mr. DIY can go global easily. Mr. Worldwide. This provides a potential limitless growth stories to attract investors. Second, many people are passive investors. They invest and leave it to the management to run the company. But for Cradle, they are active investors. They don't just invest money, but they put in time and effort into the business operations so that they can help increase the valuation of their investments in the shortest possible time to maximize their gains. And this is possible because the first point. They invest in cookie cutter businesses. Third, for this, you need to have some knowledge in investment banking. But let me just briefly brush through for you. When a company goes IPO, they appoint a principal advisor and underwriter. As a client, they will give the job to whichever investment bank that promises the best valuation on their business. With that combination of one and two, Brahma's investment can easily fetch a very high valuation from investment bankers. Come to think of it, even at 63 times PE, CTOS was able to attract 23 cornerstone investors. Hmm, is it selling a bit too cheap? Question 4. Does he really have a minus touch? Has he made any bad investments? Have you heard of Minda Global Berhad? Maybe not but I believe master skill will ring a bell. The once popular nursing college that turned into a disaster. The company had lost making for many years and even changed its name twice in hopes the company is able to turn around in its third attempt. Cradle may not have many failures, 
but this is the most famous of them all. And they lost $11 million in this investment. So yes, even super investors like him would make mistakes sometimes. Yeah! Question 5. Does Credo invest in the stock market or just in private companies? Although most of Credo's funds are invested in private companies, it does invest in the stock market too. And based on my observation, they have a very specific strategy similar to its private investments. A business model that is scalable, a product that is sellable to a diversified base of consumers. Again, a cookie cutter business. Let's take a look at his investments in the market. GHL Systems, a well-known payment gateway company that you probably come across when making payments anywhere. Excel Force, one of the big two stock trading platform providers in Malaysia. And apart from that, they also invested other stocks such as OCK, Uzma and 7-Eleven. Question 6. What is the story of CTOS? CTOS was founded in 1990 by the Chung brothers to provide credit reporting services to banks. At that time, the internet was not commonly used and everything was done via fax. It comes out here. And that will change the way you do business forever. In 2014, Credor invested in CTOS. Following the same modus operandi, they worked with the management and aggressively grew the business through major investments in product development, and IT infrastructures. Currently, CTOS is the market leader in credit reporting business in Malaysia. Today, Credo owns 80% stake in the company. Again, we can see CTOS is a cookie cutter business. Everyone needs a credit report when they borrow money from financial institutions. So, it is a business that can grow exponentially and technically, its product can be used by anyone in the world. Mr. Worldwide! Then, see? Same pattern. If you are interested in investing in CTOS, you have to read the prospectus. But I know you're sure lazy. So let me point out some important areas that you must pay attention to. Don't go away, ah. Huh? The next part is really important. This is a very important chart. Don't understand? Let me explain. Currently, CTOS operates in two countries, Malaysia and Thailand. From this chart, we can see that Malaysia has a penetration rate of 77% for credit reporting. In fact, Malaysia is the highest penetrated market in ASEAN. In other words, we are already the most saturated market in the region. CTOS needs a new market to continue the cookie cutter story. As a result, they expanded to Thailand to mitigate the risk since the Thai market has ample room to grow. However, this may not be good enough because Hager in Thailand is below ASEAN average at 6.6% only. So, can you see where the opportunity lies? Question 7. So how? CTOS can buy or not? If your concern is whether the share price will perform well in the short run, I have no idea. These days, everything is unpredictable. However, if you are looking at the long-term prospect of the company, why don't I show you how you can evaluate the company and you tell us whether you will buy. Listing a company at 63 times PE valuation means the company has to deliver tremendous growth within the foreseeable future. Based on a news article on The Edge, assuming an annual net profit growth of 70% in FY21, its net profit will balloon to 64.6 million ringgit. Based on the forward earnings, CTOS will be valued at 37.2 times. So, the number one challenge here is to achieve a 70% earnings growth rate. Let us take a look at the possibilities of doing that. First, to protect their market share in Malaysia from competition, CTOS acquired a 26% stake in Experian, the second largest credit rating agency in Malaysia. But there's still a problem. Malaysian market is already saturated and the growth rate will likely slow down eventually. In my opinion, the only way to sustain such a high growth rate is to expand the business into other countries. As I pointed out earlier, they already have footprint in Thailand. However, the Kager is below ASEAN average. It seems that Thais are not adopting the credit rating system fast enough. So, the best opportunity is the Philippines. The country possesses the highest Kager growth according to the chart. On top of that, the penetration rate is still low as well. Therefore, providing a huge growth potential for CTOS. CTOS definitely knows this. From what we have gathered so far, CTOS made its first regional investment in the Philippines by acquiring CB Information Inc. or in short, CB. The first and the most established credit reporting agency in the country. And CTOS is projecting top-line growth of between 20 to 30% compounded annual growth rate at CB over the next five years. Excited? Excited? However, if you read the prospectus carefully, you will see this. 
Let me translate the alien language into English for you. If you're going to buy sea toss that is going to be listed on the 19th of July, I'm sorry, this icing on the cake is not included in the sales. While some justify the reason for this action is because CB is still a loss-making company, but on the other hand, you can also expect them to turn the company around and sell it at a higher valuation to sea toss in the future. Hmm. That's something a super investors would do to maximize their profits. So now you have a challenge again. Where is this 70% earnings growth going to come from? Where are they? Well, some say that it's going to come from the growth of revenue per capita. Since the US and the UK have much higher revenue per capita on credit reporting, Malaysia may catch up to it. Therefore, providing ample growth opportunities. But wait a second. If you look at this number, you will find ASEAN revenue per capita is only 151 ringgit and Malaysia is already 4.5 times higher than the regional average. What are your thoughts? For me, this is going to be challenging as there is a reason why ASEAN region has a low revenue per capita. This is because almost half of ASEAN population is unbanked. So, there's no use of a credit score for those people at this moment. Their financial problems are not solved by traditional financial systems which rely on credit scores but through unconventional methods such as private lenders, shadow banking and etc. Over the past decade, we have seen some tech companies trying to disrupt the traditional financial services industry. Today, we see more tech companies joining hands with traditional banks to offer digital banking services to address the unbanked population. How will this affect CITOS? There are two arguments. First, we can say that with this movement, more people have access to financial services and the demand for credit reports could potentially increase. Therefore, contributing to the growth of credit reporting agencies such as CTOS. In this case, CTOS will have a bright future. On the other hand, we can also argue that these tech companies already have all the informations they need that are able to more accurately depict consumers' financial ability to take on a loan. For example, Grab already knows exactly what you eat, where you go, what you buy. From there, it is able to picture your financial ability to repay loans. Some things that this data can do an even better job than a simple credit report. If that's the case, credit reporting services will eventually be Obsolete! So why don't you tell us in the comments what you think? Will CTOS grow or will it become obsolete? That's all we have for today. Hashtag fuck.